Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 259, and I had a conversation with Carrie Ackery. Uh, those of you who know the Seattle music scene, uh, they, you will recognize her name. She was uh, the front woman for Hammerbox and Goodness, legendary Seattle band, and also formed the Rockfords with Pearl Jam's Mike McCready. She also put out four solo albums. Uh, and uh, again, she's a legend in the Seattle music scene for sure. Uh, we got together to chat about what she's up to now. Um, at the time of this recording, she had recently lost a friend to suicide. So I am going to give a trigger warning. We do talk about that topic quite a bit. Um, and just wanted to put it out there. If, if you or anyone you know are having suicidal thoughts, uh, please reach out to someone. Please stick around. Stay on the planet. Yeah, you're needed. I know it doesn't feel like it in the moment, but trust me when I tell you that uh, that we need you to stick around. So please do so. I've put some phone numbers on the links page on heyhumanpodcast.com. They're international numbers. So if you need to talk to somebody, please, uh, please definitely use those numbers. And uh, if you're here in the United States, the phone number to reach out to somebody on the suicide hotline is 1-800-273-8255. So that's 1-800-273-8255. We talk about all sorts of things in this episode. We talk about how one has to shift their understanding of success um, when things don't necessarily turn out the way you think they're going to turn out. Uh, what it's like just to move yourself through life and its ever-changing phases as you go through the years. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, although I've known Carrie for a very long time in in periphery, she and I have never had a sit down conversation like this one. <laughs> we definitely are alike uh, minded in in many different aspects of of existence. So it's going to be a fun one for you to listen to, I think, and uh, definitely check out Carrie's music. I uh, put links, like I said, to ways to find her on heyhumanpodcast.com on the links page. So definitely go check that out. I also put some footage of classic goodness uh, video and I threw a Lazy Susan one up there too. We talk about Kim Byron, a mutual friend of of mine and Carrie's and uh, I adore Kim and so I put a Lazy Susan song up there on the links page as well. Okie dokie, other stuff, usual suspects, social media, Hey Human Podcast can be found on uh, Instagram and on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter under Susan Ruthism. Uh, you can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. You can check out things I do besides the podcast at susanruth.com, where you can also sign up for the old mailing list. So definitely do that if you want to be updated about every four or five months on things that are going on with me and my various career tendrils. Um, rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Check out merchandise on the heyhumanpodcast.com website. You can get yourself a Hey Human t-shirt or pencil case or a hat or a face mask or, you know, whatever. Definitely do that. It helps support Hey Human. Uh, I mentioned the links page already. You can find information about every guest I have and things that we've talked about uh, from every show there on the links page. It's uh, an epic set of links. Uh, you can wander through there and discover all sorts of fun things. Again, thank you for the donation that came in a couple weeks ago. Super helpful, and I appreciate it. And I am saving up because I need a new rig. Um, I'm sure you can tell that the sound is not perfect sometimes. And that really, I just I need a new setup. So I'm saving my pennies. Going to get a new little podcasting computer and microphone. And uh, every time somebody donates, it really helps to toward that kind of stuff. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. I, of course, appreciate you for listening. Thank you so much. Thanks for getting the word out there. Um, it's growing. You know, I love doing this and I'm really proud of, of the work that is here. And um, thanks. So lots of exciting episodes coming up. 
And of course, this one is no different. So thank you. And let's get into it. Here we go. I actually, my Siri is an Englishman because I find that. <gasps> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I do. Like, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just funny to hear him pronounce things. Right? Yeah. Well, it's soothing. Do you find like the English accent really soothing? I like it. Me too. Yeah. When, I, when I'm listening to like Audible lately, I'm really into like Sandy Toxvig, who, um, who was on the Great British Baking Show. And oh, she's, okay. she's Right? Like, or any, frankly, anybody British reading books, um, I do, I find it really soothing. <laughs> yeah. For Valentine's Day, uh, since I don't have a sweetheart, I treated myself to watching Tom Hiddleston in The Night Manager. And that was lovely. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's a good choice. <laughs> he's, he's dreamy. It's Is it right? Too because I feel like if I just walked past him, I probably wouldn't. There are certain actors. Yeah. Think he seems very much, I think it's because he seems very grounded to me. I don't okay. know why. I don't know. And yeah. so I feel there's something very normal about him, which I, which appeals to me. I love that. Yeah. I feel like there's a series of actors like, um, Fassbender, is that his name? Like him. And then there's another actor who was in um, Leap Year. Did you ever see that? It's a rom-com. I did see that. Yeah. Who's that guy's name? Gosh, He's long a- I've seen that movie. Um, I know, right? But they're all kind of like, they're super like dreamy. Yeah. Like the but- Josh Radners. And yeah. The- um, even I was, I know that everyone makes um, uh, Chris, uh, what's his name? Chris Evans into... Uh, you know, the <laughs> demigod or whatever, but he seems so normal to me. Yeah. Yeah, he does. And I was like, oh, that guy's, yeah, he seems like he'd be a bro football. I mean, he seems very kind. I don't know. I don't, Frankly, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. He's really, he's into politics. He seems intelligent. I don't know. I think I just like good brains. And if they happen to sure. be put into nice looking <laughs> vessels, then, you know, I'm here for that. I'm not going to complain. <laughs> you're like double good. <laughs> you, you're married, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you and your, your significant other have uh, the people like that are the, the oh. passes or whatever? The crush. Oh, my, <laughs> I might, but I think my husband's way too shy. If I said that to him, I think you'd be like, yeah, no, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you know, like, you know how hard it was for me to like <laughs> find somebody to bond with. And I think funny enough, I don't know, unless he's not telling me. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's your celebrity crush? Oh, it always changes. For a while, it was James McAvoy. That was a while ago. Um, That's a great choice. What an actor. Yeah, I know, okay, right? And, and may I be on board of whichever board is the one that gives him an Oscar for his performance in the in the uh, Unbreakable series. Where he plays that multiple personality. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. I think that kind of scared me. Oh, it's so good. Is See, it good? Okay. He seem, seamlessly shifts in and out of these different personalities. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's extraordinary. I think he's a great actor. I think you're right. I think he's a consummate actor. Like, he's like, appreciates the craft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who else is cute? Recently, I had a really odd crush. Or maybe not odd, but um, hold on. I got to figure out who this guy is. He's on Ant Man, but he's not. Um, not Paul Rudd. Not Paul Rudd. He's another, the, he's another regular guy. Yeah. He's the husband to his ex-wife. Who is that guy's name? Uh, I got to look him up. You'll know when I say who he is. Aunt man. Look, I got to look it up. Um, <sighs> My old roommate was madly in love with Paul Rudd. And we were in a coffee shop <laughs> in, in here in California and uh, uh, in Studio <laughs> City. And Paul Rudd was there and during a, having a business meeting or something. He... Uh-huh. He exudes nice guy, firstly, and he was right. you know in his little baseball cap, and she was she was losing her mind. It was so funny. Like, oh my god, oh and my he, god. He got up to use the restroom and walked right past our table, and and you know he looked at her and she looked at him, and they there was this moment that I watched on their faces, him being. I know, you know, I know, you know, kind of thing. Totally. Do you, know, you know, I know that you know, I know, you know. <laughs> so funny. Oh my God. I bet he is. And he's another guy who's done um, all kinds of stuff. Like mm-hmm. I always equate him. I don't equate, he's not the same, but like um, Parker Posey. I love like, her. Yeah. Yeah. Like they've always done really good comedy. Um, the guy I thought it was cute was Bobby Cannavale. I don't know who that is. I don't think. I'll show you. Hold on. 
Can you I see my? Him. Can you see my phone? Oh, I love him. Right? Yeah, he is. He's a he's a keeper, as they say. He's dreamy. He is. I get that completely. <laughs> Another like he's he's quite handsome. He's got that yeah. thing going on, yeah. and he's tall. Yeah, like tall and lean. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Gotta stop thinking about it. Stop it. <laughs> Welcome to Who's Your Crush with Susan and Carrie. If you're just tuning in. <laughs> oh my God. What if you did have a podcast about that? Like, and, and sustained it, right? Like, maybe you could just make it the top 10. Otherwise, you're like, are these girls always just like <laughs> crush crazy? <laughs> oh, I have so many crushes. It's, it's wonderful. It's a fun way to live your life, you know, to have these. Have you, have you ever had the crush that's like, especially with people on film or whatever, where all of a sudden you're like, I mean, I consider myself pretty, you know, normal average, but like almost obsessive, like a little bit like, why am I so all of a sudden sure. super like, I mean, it only lasts for like a couple of days and then I'll be done. Be like, what was that? Is that hormones? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, you were probably ovulating. <laughs> okay. Could be. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. <laughs> Let's put that mystery to rest. All right. <laughs> That's going to be my excuse. Uh, what are you doing in this man's bushes? I was ovulating. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Do I need to explain? Look what away. for me? <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> well, Carrie Acri, welcome to Hey Human. Thank you. <laughs> How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I'm I'm doing good. I had some hard news show up last week. And so um you're making me feel way better. I'll tell you that. Like I'd say like 20 minutes ago, I was like, oh God. <laughs> um and uh, so I had a friend of mine who's close uh that I was close to um pass away uh who committed suicide and so um i don't i don't believe i've had anyone close to me um pass from suicide and so it's hit me in waves mm. um and it had been a couple years since i had talked to him it was when i lived uh, in minneapolis and i mean just the kindest person just so kind like sweet would be uh who he was um and in everyone's mind that, you know what I mean? So I, I think, I think what's hit me too is like when I got the news, someone had messaged me and there's that shock. And I, for me, why it's, I think also triggering a bunch of things is that I remember what this feels like when my mom passed. So it was a sudden thing. Um, and that's a particular experience, you know, because you don't have time to catch up and it's just happening or it's happened. And so your mind kind of does this, like, what, 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 you know, like, uh, and you're kind of coping and, um, in, in motion. Um, and so when I found out, I, it just, it hit me hard, um, a lot because he was so kind and his family is so sweet and, and not understanding it, you know, like I haven't, I haven't had someone close to me pass and I'm like, and then I know who he is and I'm like, how, what, like just a real, um, a mystery. And I think that happens a lot to people where you don't, you might not realize. Um, and so I pretty instantly, and maybe this is the way I cope too, is I, um, started looking for information, like not necessarily even with friends or family, cause I didn't want to intrude. Um, but also just sort of like what, how, what? And so I kind of start looking for books and information about suicide and the suicidal mind and um, uh, friends then, you know, got online in the way that there's a helpful community out there um, and had friends send information or share their experiences literally just to understand like, what is this? You know, do you find that the answers you were seeking showed up in those books or are they more something that's going to happen inside of yourself? Um, well, some of the answers were great. I had a friend send me a link to Robert um, Sapolsky's. He's a professor at Stanford and he puts all his classes up online, which I think is amazing. But she sent me a link to one of his classes specifically about the depressed mind um, and suicide. And it was incredibly informative. Not only does he talk about like the biological aspects of someone who 
has that depressive state, but psychologically as well. And it would just, it was, it was incredibly informative because so much of the time you do hear like, there would be nothing you can do. There's nothing you could do because that mind is in a particular state, but also functions a certain way and certain things are happening that no kindness could, can fix. Yeah. It's not about that. It's not about that outside influence. But I think people's natural reaction is to think it is. Sure. If you don't know, right. You're like, well, what could I have done? Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I should have called. How much more, you know, could I have reached out? And I think the thought that like none of that would help can be a mind bender if you just don't know um, about what goes on or what is potentially biologically happening in that mind. Um, And so I found that really helpful. And then other people sharing their experiences. And the thing about that for me was that I could see other people go, yeah, me too. You know, like no answers or, or I've been in these shoes as well. Um, Harder even compared to myself, right? Like much deeper and harder experiences. Um, And in general, I think that's helpful if you've experienced grief firsthand, because it feels like a particular club, you know? Has Wyatt's death helped you to grieve further your mom's death then? Yeah, yes. It triggered a bunch of memories of initial coping. So I had to think about it again, you know, the first, so my mom had a massive aneurysm um, and past. So I just, I just started to remember like the first three months. Um, And those are really, uh, I mean, everybody's different, but like, for me, those were um, surreal moments. And I've, I've said, I think I've said before on with friends or on Facebook that you're, you're not like, I'm not, no one's prepared for grief and what it's going to do. And it takes its own its own time, its own way, and everyone's different. Um, and I certainly wasn't prepared or, and didn't know what was coming down the pike. And so just the things like feeling out of it or tired or surreal or, you know, everyone around you is living a normal life and you're, you know, yeah, I'm on the bus and I'm going to work and, you know, but, but you're not, right? You're not. And then the ways that we try and like, just keep normal life going and the body's like, F you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh-uh. But and so you're not you're not in control. You really got to let it for some time, let it process. And the onion layers uh with any with any, you know, anyone's passing too, like the things you hadn't thought about about that person or your relationship to them or the effect of their passing. And so I would just have these onion layers coming off of like especially with my mom saying, "Oh, what does this mean?" You know, like, "Oh, 40 more years without her, like concepts would be hitting me. Um, She was the pillar of our family. And then it was like, now what? Like, oh, now we don't really have a family. You know, like we don't get together. Like just, so being patient with yourself and letting, riding that ride, which could take years. Do you get mad at Wyatt at all? Because somebody like your mom who was taken out uh, due to no fault of her own, just, bam, that happened. And then here's this other person, healthy, not obviously mentally healthy, but but healthy in general to then make that choice. I think about that sometimes Mm. with friends I have had who have uh, committed suicide and compare those feelings to, I mean, on one level, I get it. And in some, in some ways, I think, wow, that was really a brave choice, which is, I know, fucked Mm -hmm. up. But it, it is this thing in my head is like, well, that was really brave because in that moment, you made the ultimate choice for yourself that had no one else. It's, it's a selfish choice. It's all right. about the person in the moment, which in a, in a weird way, it's the ultimate killing of the ego. Yeah, but you know, when you read about it a lot, um, there's more, there's more um, info that says that person is not in control. Mm. that it is on them the depression is has control of them when i've felt so so it's weird i have been in moments uh where i've contemplated it deeply and the thing that i am aware of luckily i've always had the the knowledge that oh well tomorrow i'll probably feel better 
right? right. So I've already got that grip going on, which is, you know, that little pinky on the edge of the cliff. Mm-hmm. But, um, but there's also this, it never felt depressed to me. It, yeah. all, it, it never felt like that. It felt more, trying to describe this is tough. It's more like an, an absence of any kind of feeling. You just don't feel anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I was watching that class that um, Robert Sapolsky, he says, uh, taught, he was saying um, the depressed mind biologically, if they have something, cannot return to hope. Like mm-hmm. they, it's like someone who's done heroin and you've burned out your dopamine receptors, right? Like they literally can't return to hope or pleasure. So imagine if your brain can't feel pleasure and like, and I know what you're saying, even if I get depressed, my brain can go, it will get better. Like, sure. yet yeah, we feel like crap. This is, I mean, I can see, I can have some of the depressed experiences where for days or maybe a you know, month even say like, oh, I can tell something's wrong and I'm depressed and sad and I know nothing's wrong outside, but I can't see it. Like I'm just, I'm depressed. I can't, I can't get up or whatever, but never do I not believe or have in my brain, this will get better, you know? And it does, right? My brain can do that. Yeah. But he was saying that like someone who's really got deep depression issues biologically their brain can't do it i've read some things about people who have attempted suicide and and not not been able to die uh for whatever reason either they are found or somebody brings them back or whatnot that they report back now this isn't true for everyone obviously because there are some people that attempt suicide multiple times and then finally are this is the weirdest word ever to use successful mm-hmm. but uh but for those who in the moment go oh shit that's not what i really wanted to do right right but for some they've crossed some line and they not they won't get back from that i remember when i was a little kid for example i'm looking in the mirror in the bathroom going i'm gonna take myself out that'll show my mother Ooh. but then having the 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 wherewithal to know who I'd hurt in the process and going but my dad would be devastated so in a weird roundabout way he kept me on the planet right right well another thing that I um found out was sometimes someone can really believe that everyone will be better off without them of course right sure that they really believe that they really have gotten either and I'm I guess I'm gonna use the right words like that's the mental state they're in how how they got there I don't know what that process looks like like you know beating yourself up or whatever or does your mind just tell you that like oh yeah this this is just this is a good thing to do you know Uh, and and if you want to get into the woo aspect of it Mm -hmm. I have read stuff about folks who do feel like it's almost like there's another person whispering in your ear saying this is the best option do it do it and it makes me wonder what who is that voice what if it is not somebody of the person that you know all that stuff I think about all these things because nobody knows who who knows right well and you you know I don't know if you were alluding to earlier to like if I feel bad about at least about my mom's I mean I'm very woo woo so (laughs) in some ways that really helped me with my mom's passing whether I liked it or not I you know I certainly would prefer her back on the planet she's one of my all-time favorite people but I, I do feel like our souls decide when they're going to go, you know, and I mean, I go more woo and say, we, we come in with a plan, you know, and that uh, I'm on that train as well. Yeah. Woo, so, woo. <laughs> woo, woo, here we go. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, that really helped me a lot too, because I was like, well, you know, uh, it really internally made sense to me, like to not be selfish about it, right? Like, okay, mom, you wanted to go. I could, and I could see why. I could see how she would be ready to go, whether I liked it or not. Um, I really felt like a kid if I would get upset because it'd be like me tagging, come up, you know, like mom, you know, like stay here for me, you know, like when she needed to go. Um, and that's that's how I look at it. Yeah. So I don't, you know, for her. I just think she was ready to go and that's it. You know what I mean? Uh, And and I've had like readers, mediums. um, When she passed pretty quickly, I got a hold of two folks I knew who were mediums and they said the exact same thing. Um, It was, she was ready to go and she's really sorry, but they said something more distinct that I really carried with me was like, 
she also knows that like you can't become your whole person if she's here still here and I was like and I really knew that was true like because we all hung on our apron strings kind of thing somehow you know what I mean and so that really rung true for me like wow that I get it that sucks but I get it (laughs) and and with Wyatt I mean he if you and I have this sounds like the same belief system and it's really hard for people to hear Mm -hmm. I think especially for those left behind but again if that was the plan and you know he took off when he wanted to take off or when he was supposed to take off and who knows what it's supposed to the teachable moment as they like to say right you know I always say (laughs) I got enough character now it's time to send me money (laughs) that's awesome yeah you know what I mean it's like okay we get it we're gonna learn something great you know (laughs) did Wyatt uh, have a significant other and and family around yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that's I and I I don't know what to do with that just yet. I mean, especially children. I don't, that devastates me the most. Oh, yeah. So, because I have to dig deep in my woo bag (laughs) to just, um, like you said, how things play out, we don't know. And initially, we're just in pain and we're sad and, and angry, maybe. You know what I mean? Those are all fair human emotions. And I, I would never attempt to, press how I process things or what I believe on someone. I mean, those are all regular, of course, of course, human emotions, fear, afraid, right? Like, I think a lot of things are mostly fear-based, like, holy hell, now what? Like, it's our ego, it's our our ego battling again. And I just, you know, for his family, I think they're devastated, scared. I can't, children aren't in control and they're, they love their dad. Yeah. And so, that's just, I think what I feel bad about is I'm like, that's some heavy shit for some kids to have now. And yeah. I, I don't love that. And there's, n- there's not a lot of ways to make sense about it unless you dip into the the other yeah. side, of it, the woo-woo side or the religious side. If you're religious, they, I think that there's still something around that as well that people can can see that there is a master plan at work or whatever. Yeah. 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 I, you know what? I would, I wouldn't probably say that to him today. You know what I mean? Like today's not oh. the day, you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't say it to anyone to, <laughs> right? yeah. you know, this is me, you know, uh, me being philosophical, mm-hmm. but in, I don't know, in death, de- death is so layered. And, yes. and I talk about death a lot on this show and, and yeah. it is so layered and how it affects everyone and everything in its orbit and how afraid we are of it. And then there are others like uh, kids who are on their deathbeds that embrace it with such grace. Right. That makes no sense. Where did they get that skill? You know, you're so right. Yeah. You're so right. Yeah. And we don't talk about death in this nation. I don't think in this culture, Yeah, we don't like, and we are afraid of it, right? Like people are afraid of it. Um, And you know, that gets coached and cultured into you depending on what viewpoint is there. And, um, which I do think is a shame, right? Like I, 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 I wouldn't wish that on anyone, right. To be afraid. Um, I don't know if everybody's going to believe me and what I believe. Um, like I'm probably similar to you is like, I think we start as energy. We come in as energy. We return as energy, right? Like no one ever really dies. They're always there with you. Um, and there's lots of evidence to prove that or things like that, but not everybody's going to believe that. And, and um, I, I would wish that for them because it would maybe make things a little easier because I don't wish anybody pain. Like nobody wants someone to No, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Right. Like grieving like that, grieving someone. It's so, it can feel so never ending. Like you're yeah. never going to stop crying. You're never now what they're always gone. How the hell am I going to, recover from this other than to live one's life yeah 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 exactly and things do get better things do get better and they Um, get worse and they get better and they get yeah exactly (laughs) the roller coaster is is you know is a battle and for i don't you know obviously i don't know wyatt i can't speak for wyatt i don't know if he left a note or let anyone in on how he was feeling but um I, I I would like to believe that right now, wherever 
you know, probably listening in on this conversation, probably. but it's <laughs> thinking like, uh, I'm sorry for the people I've hurt in the process of making this choice, but it's not like I didn't tell you guys before I came in the play, you know, came to the planet, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It gives me humor about it, you know, it gives me yeah. it, the people I know who have died is irritating. Why did you do that? But yeah. then, I'm, like, as you said, the idea that energy never ceases, and I like to think, well, the, the universe is a closed system. There is nothing that exists that hasn't always existed, and there is nothing that exists that won't always exist. Mm-hmm. And, and for, for whatever the, the arc of the universe is, you yeah. know, someday yeah. that might blip out, who knows. But in, in concept, we know that there is nothing that isn't always and will always. So that brings me comfort. Yeah, for sure. Well, and Ryan's family is surrounded by love. And that's great. Not, you know, it's a, it's a week out, right? So they're in it there. But I, there's so much love around them. And I'm very happy about that. Yeah. I mean, their neighbors, their family, I mean, they are surrounded by love. And that's a lesson unto itself, don't you think? Like That can bring people together. Yeah. Yeah. And they have really beautiful friends um, coming together. And you're right. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's a beautiful lesson unto itself. Although, you know, you wouldn't wish someone to learn a lesson that way. But but yeah. you got to, I, I think you said too, like you got to, it's multi-layered and you got to look at, if you can keep your eyes open and look for the things that you can learn from it, there are the things that come out of it. And I would hope too that that people aren't afraid to talk to the kids about death. I think we try to shelter children from the concepts of death. And the truth of the matter is kids are smart as fuck and they're incredibly intuitive. Yeah. They read a room like nobody's business. They read emotions like nobody's business. So when you think you're hiding something from a kid, Right. You're not, you're not, you're not. And they will, yeah. they have their own egos to contend with. And so then they're going, what have I done wrong? Right. Or where am I in all of this? Yeah, I agree with you. Kids are so super smart. That's a thing I remember from being a kid myself thinking like, why, I don't think the adults understand that I get more hair than, <laughs> than they let on. And when my, when my mom passed my, my son, um, oh man, they were like a match made in heaven. Like, which is beautiful, right? Um, but I, I remember having to tell him, I mean, he was pretty young. He was six. Um, but he was willing to talk about it. And he was willing, you know, I didn't, we didn't push him. Um, but he was willing to talk about it. I think it more made him, I think what was hard for him is it made him afraid then if that can happen, are you guys going? And I, for a year, I think for a year, every day he would say, when are you guys going to die? You know, my husband and I, every day, are you guys? And he literally said to me, and I love, I do love this just because I respect his own needs. One day he, he was like, are you going to die? And he, and I, before I could answer, he said, I just need you to tell me that you're never going to die. Like he knew what he needed. And he looked at me like going, I know the truth, but right now I just need you to tell me this. And I was like, "Um, yeah, you got it. I still have Powerful. that conversation with my father, who I adore. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, when I talk to him, we have this thing. I was like, okay, you know, how are you feeling today? How's it going? You know, what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, remember, you promised me you know, you're going to live to 180. <laughs> and he said, that sounds exhausting. But that's just had my entire life that he's yeah. supposed to live to nearly, you know, two centuries. And so that... I can also be old and then we can go at the same time kind of thing. And I joke about how I'm going to take his brain and put it in a jar and hook it up to electricity so I can still have conversations with him. Like the man with two brains. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. Yes. Yeah. Way back. Is that yeah. like Steve Martin? No, it is. Yeah. It is. Right. <laughs> Steve Martin. I think Lily Tomlin. Oh my God. That's hilarious. Yes. Oh, that's lovely though. You sound like you guys have a, like an amazing relationship. It's wonderful. And it, it makes up for what isn't there with, not, not that I don't love my mom, of course I do, sure. I'm her daughter, but for what that relationship is lacking, it, sure. I get it tenfold in my father, which is good. You know? Yeah. Interesting lessons, right? Maybe you, and it's interesting to think like, oh, did I, oh, I can't, is this what I signed up for? Like I said, I wanted to learn this lesson. Oh, <laughs> like really? All the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but the character, I get it. You know. <laughs> well, I used to laugh. My mom used to. It's so funny, like because we were we weren't we weren't similar in some ways. It's very interesting, like how everybody comes in themselves, right, with your own wisdom and personality. And I'm very different from my mom. My mom grew up in Idaho, potato farming, Swedish, like you know, pretty stoic or conservative in terms of like, they're not demonstrative. Right. And then I always say to my mom, I'm like, yeah, well, you married the French alcoholic and voila. <laughs> and so I'm a lot more gregarious and, uh, and my dad was a musician. And so I have that side, which means I'm willing to get up in front of people. Right. And you're a musician. right? Like, so, so it's like, there would be things I would do where my mom would be like, you know, but that's who I am, right? Or the way I look at things are being woo. And so I just think about that too in terms of soul contracts going, I feel like her, regardless of the fact that we weren't a, a lot alike, we had known each other for a long time and there was like maximum love, mm. right? Like, well, yeah, maybe I'm here. I see stoicism in you. Oh yeah, right? Like I'm here, I'm here to show you this and then I'm here to show you that. But even watching you on stage back back then, uh, I could see the stoicism in your performance. You were g gregarious and certainly someone that everybody turned to look at because I don't think you could be a front person of, right. you know, without that quality. But there was also that you also had that. Really? I think so. Oh, cool. Maybe I was just enduring, which stoicism is often about. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> or just, um, there's something about coping or standing still. You know what I mean? So even if it's just internal, in order to do something. Or there's also a lot being given on stage when you're performing, oh especially God. to a gigantic, for you, you know, thousands. But even in the smaller, like the crocodile venues or things like that, where there was smaller, the, you are giving and any any performer that's a front person is pouring out exponential amounts of energy. And so yeah. I think that you do at the same time of giving everything you have to them, there is still a part of you that is locked in a safe box going, you yeah. don't get this. Yeah, you're really right. It's funny. I just had this conversation with someone about... Um, like pre-show feelings or nervousness and all of that. And you're right um, about the amount of energy, but we were also talking about like, you're giving out a lot of energy, but once you put set foot on stage, you're, you're at the whim of a lot of energy. And I think the stoicism for me is like, I have to keep a foot on the ground in order to like, consciously do what I want to like be awake for it as opposed to like, you know, like just and yeah. wanting to do that. Like I want to like, I want to be in this and see all of it. Um, but it's like being on a ride. Don't you think like, you don't Absolutely. know, but I do think you were excellent at, at being grounded in the, in the, oh, thank you. Thick of it, especially in the kind of music that well, we uh -huh. should tell everyone who may not know <laughs> you, of course, were the front woman for the band goodness. And then uh, Hammerbox and the Rockfords. So yeah. Yeah, triple, triple big band. I mean, those were all quite successful. Mm -hmm. But I would yeah. argue that Goodness was at the pinnacle of the Seattle. Of course, a lot of the guys are the ones that really, really went. Right. Places. Yeah, but, yeah. But as a woman in, in that time frame to front a band that became so well-known and so um, yeah. in the zeitgeist, that was a major deal. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it was. You know, I said to a friend, I really appreciate that because I was talking to a friend who's known me probably the whole time um, just for like for once. And I don't usually do this looking back on your accomplishments and thinking about them a different way. And I was like, name another woman who was in one successful band, left that band on purpose, started another one, made that that became successful, and then did other projects, including solo stuff. And solo stuff, yeah. 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 And um, I just felt more proud. And I that's like in the last year even. I, I've never thought like that. Um, but that's kind of a part of my character to sort of like not I'm not risk adverse or change adverse. And I'm sort of like that the metaphysical sort of like, I don't know until you, you know, like my gut says this, I go here. 
Um, and until proven differently, this is the direction I'm going. <laughs> so I do live a lot by that. Um, do you feel the pressure? Because, I mean, Kim Byron, another sensational. Mm -hmm. uh, Wonderful. Yeah, and dear friend of both of ours. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Lazy Susan was her band. Mm -hmm. And I think for the other females that were just putting their foot, their toe in the water, myself included, of, of being a performer and being on stage, to watch these women who embodied power, mm -hmm. commanding so much power in a super duper male dominated field, yeah, was really something. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Kim and I are really close. We talk a lot recently too. It's nice yeah. to have. I love her. God, right? heart. I love her heart. Yes. Yeah. Oh, huge heart. Yeah. And a phenomenal like singer. And it's been nice in the last like, I don't know, 10 or so years to talk more about that stuff. Whereas I think at the time, uh, like, I don't remember ever talking to peers. I think you're just busy with your own thing. Um, and I, in particular, just hadn't ever, I've been pretty loner-ish in my life. And I don't mean like, ooh, I'm a loner, but I just had always done things on my own. And so, didn't have girlfriends at the time. I mean, Did I had a big... Did you feel competitive? Did you have that sense that, oh, these people are coming up behind me or they're, or they're lateral to me? And like, you know, you and Kim mm -hmm. were coming up in the same... Mm -hmm thing no I never felt that no because I really believe in like the cornucopia of life that's I mean, great I, yeah. yeah I really think oh she's doing she's on her path I hope she does you know everything she can do and I do this and mm -hmm. you and know, your music like, was different I mean it was same yeah. but different it really had a there was yeah a different vibe to but it. I always believe there's enough for everybody like I, I really that never crossed my mind I, I will I'm very like dorky giddy to bond I would have been more excited to do that, like bond on it, like um, with no, no sense of competition about it. Well, because she got a husband out of your band. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And a very good one. Yes. Oh, a very kind of band. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I think people mistake, like when people get envious, they don't know someone's whole life too. Right. Like, so, sure. you know, it's like, oh, you think you might want to be me? No, you don't want that. Because mm -mm. you don't know about this, this or this, or what else is going on. And, or what it entails to do this. And, um, and I'm not, e I've never been um, egotistical about like, uh, like untethered and fantastical in my head about like, this is amazing. You know, like I am very much my mother's daughter in terms of pragmatism, you know, like I'm, I, in some ways I make the worst rock star person because I'm so pragmatic. <laughs> like if I was, if, if somebody was doing something crazy, like, I remember meeting Courtney Love, right? Like just her, her way or her personality. And my, my nature is to be like, oh, for God's sakes, like that's ridiculous. <laughs> like somehow just very like, mm, that's unnecessary. <laughs> just, you know? Right. But in a way that saved me a lot because I didn't get freaked out very easy ever. I just was sort of like, oh, well, there's that. Okay. You know what I mean? Like anything like people using heroin or weird things backstage or, you know, things that could be really scary. My mind goes pretty like <laughs> realistic or pragmatic fast. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. And uh, heroin, was heroin was certainly the drug mm -hmm. of choice in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably still is for all I know, but yeah. But it's so nice. It's so nice to, again, commune with women who were playing music like Deja, um, Rachel Flotard, we had Viz Queen. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Viz Queen. Yeah. Heather Doobie, Kristen Berry. Um, recently, I made this um, Spotify playlist with uh, Viz Queen, Heather Doobie, Kim Virant, and Deja um, called She Does It Well, She Does It Better. And it's amazing. Go listen to it. And I remember, because it's just fun to put a playlist together. But I remember as I was listening, I was just like, this shit's amazing. And it's still yeah. amazing. Like all these yeah. women made incredible, still make art. And I'm like, and it's still good. Like it stands the test of time. And I almost felt a little furious about it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you talk about like, you're like, well, it, the bands that got really huge were all male led. Right. And sometimes I still feel like, that's who gets looked at, right? That's who's yeah. celebrated. And I'm like, you know, it feels, it can feel like, oh, I hadn't sold enough records to get a, that kind of attention. And I 
you know, it kind of boils down to that. Because I can think of a lot of male fronted bands who didn't sell a lot of records and you didn't hear about them either. You know what I mean? Like, what's her? What's not that those bands aren't amazing, but at the same time, there's some, I feel like there's some of that going on. And I think I just felt righteous about these women too, because it was, it's really good. Yeah, it's the Pacific really good. Northwest uh, gave music a huge body of work. Yeah, still does. Still does. Sure. Right? Yeah. Like we go back to jazz. Like, what, I, mean, it, I wonder what it is about the Northwest. Oh, the jazz it, scene is fantastic. Right? There. Like it's, and it's, there's always been something going on or, or, you know, like it could go in waves, but there's always something brewing, you know, and there's always something new, incredible music being made. I don't know. It's really weird. I was talking to um, a producer at KEXP, which is the independent station, right? Um, Up in Seattle. And we were talking about for March doing a, an interview with myself and someone who, uh, uh, you know, someone doing music today, um, just to compare, like, not only the path of music and talk about our experiences, but also the difference in Seattle. Mm. I mean, I feel so, I don't know about you, but like, I feel so lucky that I got to experience Seattle when you could afford it. <laughs> well, I, I go back to visit my family, my parents and everything, and I, I get lost. I, I, used yeah. to know, I used to know every freaking street in Seattle. I mean, right. every street. And I go there now. I'm like, where am I? I'm exactly. so confused right now. <laughs> exactly. I just had, um, I just had Nils Bernstein um, on my podcast. I do the podcast between you and I, and you know, he's born and raised Seattle and, you know, and has been steeped in the music scene um, in his life lifetime there and was he was the vp of pr for sub pop he had you know a record store like i've known him from even before i was in Hammerbox, right so he's just always kind of been there in my life um but even he who grew up there was like goes back says the same thing he's like i get lost like i don't who yeah. don't <laughs> and i was like wow and i wonder if that's just the nature of you know people as adults going back to their childhood homes and or like going back to your high school. I went back to my high school and walked around and thought, oh, my God, <laughs> why is everything so yellow? <laughs> you hadn't thought about it at the time. Well, time has passed. Yeah. Well, but Seattle's like, like when it's so crowded now. I mean, you know, it's crowded when it's two things. It's crowded every day, including Sunday, and that did, wasn't the case. And it's crowded everywhere, including into like Crown Hill, Greenwood, you know, like it's in areas that would have been kind of no man's, you know, north of Ballard would have been kind of no man's land. And it's now crowded everywhere every day. And Ballard, it's Ballard makes me sad because I lived in Ballard after college and cute little fishing village yeah. vibe and I don't recognize it at all anymore. It's just no. condominiums and I know the, progress, blah, 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 progress, but mm. Mm. let's just say money. <laughs> you know, it's just about like money. Well, and yeah. think about when you rented an apartment. Like I always say, like I'm, I could be in a band and be a barista and have my own apartment. My apartment costs $300. Right. And a nice studio with all the little hardwoods and French doors and whatever, for days. Um, and so I think as artists, we got to, it, you know, that helps you do your art. You got to enjoy a city. You could, you know, do more things. I feel like, um, you know, your, your rent space, if you were going to rent like a practice space and all that, still affordable, you know, your band could play some shows and pay for it, you know, $400 or 300 Yeah, and you were sharing space with other bands, so the mm-hmm. camaraderie of that was really fantastic as well. Yeah, and I, I think what's, I would be very interested in the conversation too, but like, you know, we didn't have the internet. Mm-mm. Internet became popular at the end of goodness, you know what I mean? Like, so mm-hmm. Hammerbox, like we were writing down addresses. And oh, yeah. mailing postcards, you know, like there was no TikTok, there was no Snapchat, there was no mm-hmm. YouTube streaming thing, any of that stuff. So the bands, that's a, the feat of becoming successful. Then was even yeah. more so. I mean, we didn't know it at the time, I suppose, because yeah. it, everything is in its moment as it is in that moment. Hindsight, yeah. blah blah blah. But did you know? Looking back now, did you? 
I don't see how to put this. I think as a, adults, we go, okay, I understand what success is. Mm-hmm. And, but I think when we're in it, when we're younger and doing the things, we're always looking at the next goalpost and we're always moving our own goalposts. We're always looking to what, what's next, what's next. Were you ever, did you understand success in the moment? Yeah, in the way that, I mean, it was talked about all around you, especially during Hammerbox and Goodness, because the music industry was still in its old state. And so there was a very distinct process and grunge was huge. And so it was all around you. So you knew a thing was happening. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of got told and defined, like, here's the route you take currently, you know, build up your audience, get it, you know, get a manager or a lawyer, they shop you. And, or, you know, it was like the same routine. a r people come up, there's, you know, if they like you, then there's, interest in one or two or a bidding war and then you get signed and you moved on and that was still possible um and so there was that routine in place but with and we had friends close in microsoft funny enough like goodness fans who i remember like built us a website and i was like well what's this thing like what am i supposed to do this you know what i mean so thank god they were savvy but i certainly wasn't right so up until then i knew oh yeah, there's a route and you do this. And we were interested in that, right? Like everybody wants to move forward or succeed. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of knew what the next step would be, but then, and there's the things you learn once you get in there, right? And a lot of those are classic. A lot of the classic things that happen to most all bands would happen. You know, you get your a r person, uh, you know, like gets you signed and then's fired, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or someone takes over is the new leader. They flush everyone out who cared about you. Um, and then you're just kind of dead in the water, right? Or you get dropped. Or um, And I had experiences with all of that, including uh, like Love Atlantic with goodness decided they didn't care about the band. They just wanted me and went about it in a way that was really offensive to me. Um, and so what it's what you learn along the way is like, what comes next on each level of success and it's not lovely all the time right and especially i think for it happens to everybody but women in particular run into some things you know like atlantic was the first time someone had asked me to lose weight you know or dress they no one forced me but they were suggesting i should dress differently um or maybe i let them down by not dressing i I, who knows right but um so those were weird lessons I started to learn along the way and didn't, and didn't love it. Like didn't go with Atlantic and they dropped us, you know, it was just sort of like you could be thrown away so easily. And I think by that time, uh, goodness went on to get signed by immortal records and all that. And um, by the end of that, like I'd say 2000, I guess that's really hard on a band and so the band slowly, the individuals went inside also start to kind of have their own issues and um, disintegrate. And by that time, I was just exhausted. Like, you work so hard. I mean, I know you know this, right? Like, you work so hard physically, emotionally, artistically. You work so hard grinding it out mm-hmm. um, only to have it literally like whoop, thrown out the door that I just hit a wall of burnout. I just was like, I need, I want some control in my life. (laughs) And so, you know, I think at about 38, like I, that's when I got my first corporate job for in the name of structure. (laughs) How did that feel? Was that a weird thing to wrap your head around? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I went in for my reasons, but then you have the corporate world to deal with. And a lot of the time that's not great either. You know, there's all the kinds, you know, depending on the company, the world within there has all its games and insecurities and just crap, bullshit. Um, And it was really hard on me at the time because you go from like being queen of your castle to now working for someone and with individuals who could care less and then they're shitty to you, right? Like, or they're doing whatever corporate climbing ladder, backstabbing. Yeah. Crap, you know, and so that that was mentally really hard. Like I couldn't wrap my head around like I owned my own business and did my own art, like my work I owned and did to navigating cor- corporate games. <laughs> like, and I think it was really hard on my self esteem. It was extremely devastating my self esteem. Um, and along the way, I think I always just I felt split down the middle. 
Mm-hmm. Like, oh, where, you know, by the time I, w- I had been in, a, you know, several jobs and big jobs, like I worked at Nordstrom.com, I worked at EMP, which is now Mopop, then got hired by Target.com. That's when we moved to Minneapolis. But I always felt, again, having done like all my 20s into my 30s music for a living, I just kind of always felt split and absent. Like, where did that, where did I go? Or mm-hmm. where is that girl? The, the, now, tr- the truth of who you yeah, are. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only up until recently that I've jumped out of work like that um, in order to like return to myself. Um, but now I do the work that I've come to find as another extension of me is um, the intuitive life coaching. And so I'll take all of my experience or natural abilities, you know, like the being risk adverse or willing to do change like that by nature, I'm like that. Um, and any of the experiences, be they musical or life in general, could be like music, grief, corporate, whatever, and bring it to folks to help them return to like an authentic state or just talk about the importance of it. Um, and that there are other ways to go build your life and live it. And you can do it from a much more authentic place. The I mean, grounded, the grounded space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's authentic to you, right? And I think that requires understanding what intuition or your gut, right? It requires making decisions from that place instead of here, right? Like you talked about the ego. I mean, that was really good too about like up here we think, I think most of us are raised to say like, figure it out, go get it, get in there, accomplish, get, you know, buy the things, do whatever, and that, that'll make you happy. And, and then, it's never enough. And it's never you, enough. Yeah. From that yeah. space, it's never enough. When really, if you can, if you can step back move your decision making from here to here which might take a while if yeah, you haven't been those listening she's moving from her head to her heart because I know yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like automatic um it, you know that might take a while for someone to either learn or relearn how to do that or what that even means or what that feels like you know to tell someone like no no from here on out I want you to make decisions that feel good not that you think are good ideas and then navigate from here that's a big yeah. step for people. Really big. It also requires re-examining what do you need? What do you really need? Do you need like your Range Rover car, you know, or, and I'm not anti-money. Don't get me wrong. I am not, neg- I'm like, money's just energy. I'm like, if you want that car, you go get that car. Mm. Um, that's lovely. Um, but when you're diverging from yourself or your what truly makes you happy in order to get that car, that's like a recipe for disaster or unhappiness. Money's just money, right? Like it's, yeah. it's just energy. But I also believe each one of us comes into this world f- with something to bring and go find that, you know, bring to the table. And you also, currency to- is different for everyone. Yeah, what yeah. your currency is. So for yeah. some, it's the coin of the realm. And for others, it's the stuff that you put in the bank that's green or gold or whatever the color of your money is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dead on. Yeah. And, you know, there's, I believe, you know, we believe like there's magic in the world, right? Like you'd be surprised if you shift your paradigm and start living from your intuition and what makes you feel really good. And I really believe everyone's birthright is joy, you know, like joy and happiness is the point, not what you made or bought or have, you know, it's the only goal here is relationships and um, joy, happiness when you can get it, right? Like, we're not always happy. Like, I'm not naive about that. But but in terms of, like, what is the goal here? Um, maybe following your heart to figure out, like, oh, you know, I've always, I've always wanted to be a gardener. And I love it. Like, you truly know what you love. Only you can answer that, right? But maybe you being a gardener helps teach somebody else about plants. And then that makes them happy. Like, it, it doesn't have to be, like, these grandiose, like, I'm a healer and I did this thing or I have a million followers and I'm this. It's it's the small stuff that has giant ripple effects. What about the people that say, I don't know what I want. I don't know that thing because there are plenty of people that have that lack of understanding of where they're supposed to go or who they're supposed to be. Yeah. I would say, call me. (laughs) No, I think, That I think if someone doesn't know, I would suggest they go take the time, space, and silence uh, and sit and 
let things, what I think happens in that space is let some things unravel, listen and notice, like listen, maybe you just need to take a lot of quiet space to unravel whatever's been going on in order to allow some space for those answers you're looking for to show up. But that takes time and practice and silence. And be prepared for what you thought was an idea might not be the idea you have at the end of it, too. Totally. That that concept of success, that has changed for me throughout my life. What I thought it looked like versus what I think it looks like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about your podcast right now. Like, all the people you're talking to, when I wrote you, I was like, oh, my God, look at all these people you thought this is amazing. You know, like... Um, and, and the ripple effect of every conversation you have, the people, you know, that you have on your podcast, like people are listening, like unknown things are happening because of what you do. Good things. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. It's, it's like the, the thing I think our culture doesn't get is that it's the slow game, right? It's not the instant big. It's a slow game. Um, content, right? Like you, cause you don't know, like, but you got to kind of get good with that. I always say uh, it's the machine at the, um, at the amusement, at the carnival, the amusement park, the, you know, the one where there's all the quarters on the flat thing and you've got the little doohickey and you put the quarter in and it goes <laughs> forward and hits the other quarters and event. And then the little sweeper doohickey comes through <laughs> oh, yeah. and, and nothing happens and nothing happens and nothing happens, but you're adding all these coins and eventually someone it may not even be you comes along and they put the coin in and they get all the yeah yeah I look at it a lot like that I remember when Jim Henson died my parents out of the New York Times cut a picture a cartoon of Kermit the Frog sitting on a lily pad and he was crying and it was sending ripples out that one tear all these ripples yes and to me that image has always been burned into my brain of the truth of it, maybe not a tear in action or a smile, you know, a, a simple gesture, a dollar in someone's cup, you know, whatever it is, we have no idea the, the seismic activity that echoes forward out of those small yeah. moments because we think it's about a grand gesture and it's not. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You're dead on. I mean, even like simple kindness. I say this a lot when I talk about corporate culture. If I'm in a group like that, I'm like small kindnesses because I don't even think people realize they don't do that. I mean, they're perfectly nice people, but I was like, how many times have you just said to someone, oh, I like you? You know what I mean? Or like, your hair looks nice today or I yeah, don't like you. sweater on you or, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Great job. I'm so glad you're here. Like, it's funny. I feel like how that doesn't happen a lot, but I think you're right. Like, we think it has to be some grand gesture, some big thing that happens. Um, and now I, in my life, I try when somebody crosses my mind, I try to text them or sometimes oh. I call them if we're in that kind of a relationship. But mostly it's a text saying or an email. You cross my mind. I hope you're doing great. And it's simple, yeah. but it feels really I think great to know that somebody out there is thinking of you. Randy. Yeah. Do you think our culture is really, our culture also has worked towards isolating us? I mean, regardless of the pandemic. It's a, well, I find it, it's a great irony, right? So here we have these devices that we're all connected to that in, on one hand, yeah. absolutely separates us and has created a world where we don't quite know how to talk to each other in a real space. But at the same time, because of those same devices, we are able to communicate with people that we never would have been able to touch or communicate with. You know, yeah. uh, there are <laughs> there are communities built upon it and there are uh, oppressive situations that are toppled because of it, you know, that would never happen if it, if it weren't for these yeah. Spaces, but it is, it's a conundrum, right? Do you think because of that, it makes it all people more nervous to directly connect? I like think when, it's a skill. Mm-hmm. It's a skill. And again, the downside of, of we being buried into these devices is that we have maybe forgotten how to just look at each other in the eye. Yeah. And, yeah. And see and feel. It's a very awkward feeling for a lot of people. Yeah, but also super powerful. Who was the artist? It's very truthful. It's very vulnerable. Yeah. I want to look up. There was a, she's a really 
famous artist. Uh, the woman with the dark yes. hair. Um, yes. Yeah, that sat at the table. Yes. Yeah. It's, Man, um, that was powerful. I want to say her name's Isabella or something like that. Uh, oh, man, I got to look at it. We gotta I, I can totally picture her. Yeah. Yeah. The performance artist. She sat at the table and then invited strangers to just come and sit and stare. No words. Stare at her. And she stared back. Oh, man. It's, isn't it? It's out there on Netflix, too, right? Netflix or I'm sure or they made something. Crime. Like but just, you're right. You remember, like, people, you could see the desperate deep need to be seen and just the tears total strangers i mean i actually think i mean i don't know what you think but like i actually think like the gross desperation for fame mm -hmm. is mostly people going i just want to be seen see yeah. me i want someone to know i exist look yeah. at me i 100 percent agree yeah. with that yeah and they people just, just lovingly want to be seen like i see you i had this idea a couple years ago that I wanted to do this kids program called I see you, which sounds creepy, but, um, but really what it was, was to be able to be with kids and let them be themselves and, you know, go, oh, I see you. you know, like, as you are like, Oh, good job. Yeah. You, as you are like, I'm not here to, I'm not here to tell you to be different, you know, unless you're hurting someone like us, but at the same time, I, kids just want to be seen like I see that oh you see it that way okay oh you're you know yeah. something about acknowledging Absolutely. yeah acknowledgement is everything and I do I have a feeling the pendulum will swing the other way because that's oh, what, yeah. what it does yeah you know every yeah. generation and now I think there are kids growing up who eschew the fact that their parents are trying to film their every move and that will create uh the pendulum going toward the other side of people becoming less into showing every aspect of who they are yeah. on the internet and yeah. maybe connecting on a more real level, especially, I mean, think about this pandemic, we've been forced into solitude and what happens on the other side of that, mm -hmm. other than a, a touchy feely free for all, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just touch me. Cause you can. <laughs> I mean, you gotta wonder what, what yeah. will become of it because we've had, we've gone through this before right? the, yeah. the, several times in the history of humans. Uh, this ain't our first rodeo. Um, so yeah. it's, a, it's a good question. And I do think I agree with you that yes, people want to be seen and heard. And I would argue one step further that it's important to see and hear yourself, which I think is largely ignored. I think we, mm -hmm. the reason why there was so much anger or pain, which is, two heads of the same coin uh hate three heads of the same coin uh that it's it's that feeling of not being heard or seen and not acknowledging that thing in yourself not allowing yourself to feel or be or i don't know i've got deep thoughts about that stuff that yeah. could be a whole other you know part two yeah yeah i feel like when i i've noticed when i've had some clients too i try and um you know, as I'm learning, like what, what is my message or what is coming to me that I, I feel compelled to share. One of the big things is like, when I'm working with someone, I'm like, you're the only thing that matters. And it's, a, and it's as you wish. So, and that's for however they show up anytime. Right. So, and to really honor that, because I think people feel skittish. They're already in their head about what they ought to be doing or what they didn't do or you know the self-criticizing and they're mean to themselves and so just trying to um really specifically let people know like you you know you are important and how does it work for you is what's important and you get to say what's important it's not about me um this is for you and about you and you get to uh, you get to own this as you wish I mean, I, why, I just rewatched The Princess Bride. And as you say that, of course, I can't, you can't help but think of The Princess Bride and Wesley for the As You Wish. But his whole vibe is just that. Yeah. Before every battle, before when he was dealing with the princess and she was being so combative, every, no matter the turn, he would say, as you wish. You yeah. are who you are, and I'm accepting everything coming out of your mouth is truth because for the person saying it, it is truth. Right. Right. And we got to have at least one space you can go to where you're completely accepted. 
you know? It certainly isn't internally for most of us, is it? Yeah. That's a tricky one. That's a lifelong yeah. experience to get yes. to that space. Do you ever feel like to, um, the just beating, beating yourself up to syndrome? Like, even if someone reaches out to make change, they've already got such a heavy critic in their own head. My ego's a motherfucker. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, even, that could be the title of your book. <laughs> love that. I love that, actually. If you can get motherfucker in there, I'm always happy. What I, a few years ago, I took um, uh, training to be a yoga teacher. Not to teach. I kind of, It was therapeutic for me. Uh-huh. So, I got yoga teacher training, but I, I so love the, like, namaste, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <for laughs> like, I just wanted some t-shirt that was like. I didn't. I guess that's disrespectful in the end, but at the same time, I, I a little bit of that I like. I don't know. I feel like the Zen folks would totally be on board with that because <laughs> even if you listen to like a Ram Dass or an Alan Watts, you know these people mm-hmm. who, or a uh, 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 Prima Sh- Children, right? Mm-hmm. That they all they all say the same thing. That yeah, we we've got it down. We know what's up, but also guess what? We get angry and we get stuck in our head and we, yeah. we lose the battle with our own ego so yeah. even P- or the Gandhis or the Dalai Lama that they're, yeah. they are, understand that this vessel is imperfect yeah, and, and a mosaic and a journey. And uh, I get everything. I understand it all. And then the next day I know nothing. I understand none of this. So frustrating. Amen. How do you feel about um, with your podcast and the things that you're doing? How do you do that long distance walk of like, because on some, some days I'm like, oh, I feel super purposeful. Like, it seems very clear to me. And then on some days I'll be like, I have no idea. Like what? <laughs> like, what well, in, I- in terms of the podcast, for mm-hmm. me, uh, I know I'm very calm and uh set and grounded in my intention of this show so that part for me is easy that's great yeah this this to me is is the best thing in the world conversation yeah Yeah. Uh, i learn and i I know for people that have been listening to podcasts forever this is ad nauseum of me what i'm about to say but (laughs) i learn as much about you Uh uh-huh and in that conversation, as I'm learning about you, I learn that much about myself. Oh, that's awesome. I learn who I am by what I'm not and by, and by what I am based on what you are. Does that make sense? Yes, 110%. Yes, I love that. And so the journey of this podcast and I that isn't to say there aren't some days and my best friend Ellen would uh, attest to this because she hears me say this every once every once in a while of me saying I don't know is this is this pointless this podcast does it matter does it matter in the grand scheme of things and it's sort of like songwriting in a a way that you know in the morning of my co-writes or whatever or even the morning of my writing by myself I think what's the fucking point has anyone has anyone seen the music industry lately it's garbage but Mm -hmm. you know but then at the other end of it I'm like oh my god I love this song I've created something you know that really means something to me and the good news is I think as a as a younger person when I I was so much more precious about my creations and I thought this has to go out in the world this has to have its way I have to be the one singing it I have to do you know I had all these expectations on everything yeah and that's youth in some ways you know of course but now um and I think this happened to me probably about I'm gonna say about a decade ago that I one day I realized oh fuck it's it's not about me I'm creating these things that firstly are gifts right I'm just a conduit so yes I am an active participant in the moment but I also have this understanding that anything I'm creating doesn't truly belong to me because art belongs to all. Oh, I love that. And so I let it, I learned to let it go. And whether a song I've written will ever be cut by another artist or not, um, I've let go of that. I just, it doesn't matter. And I can joke about it and think, what's the point? But at the same time, I know that, well, I like, I have paintings that I painted years ago that suddenly someone sees it and says, oh, I, I want that painting, which, you know, everything in its yeah. time and space. Yes. And as you mentioned, this podcast may be heard by someone down the line. And yeah. I have no control out of any of that. 
this is the long walk. This is the long walk, the long game, right? Like learning how to do this and live this way. This is, this is it. Everything you're saying, like, you don't know, you know, but I think finding contentment in every day and thinking about things the way you're thinking about them helps a lot, helps a lot just for understandings and truth. And being okay with the fact that tomorrow I might think, oh fuck you know nobody loves me everybody hates me guess i'll go eat worms you know there's <laughs> you know I remember that yeah, and yeah. That's okay too or you know the one word one word from someone on an off day and you, everything crumbles around you you know you're building right. your castle as best you can but the tide still comes in and if that foundation isn't solid there goes your castle yeah no you're dead right that was so helpful to hear i think i needed that today <laughs> well and it's good to hear another musician to say have had that moment where you're asking yourself why am i doing this like i need to remember my why yeah um and i'm similar to you i i was i i, I could remember and name the things that are important about it like like you said, being the conduit to writing something, maybe that affects somebody else, um, even locally and communing. Right. And I like to, I, I can do the things that I like to do, whether someone cares or not. And I found a lot of gratitude in that. Like I can write, I can go record, I could play a show live, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I'm good to go. I don't have anything more to worry about. And having been on the other side, you know, the things that people are wishing for, Sometimes you got to stop and go like, well, what's that, re- you know, what's that really going to get you? What's that really entail? And I had to wrestle with that for a while in terms of regret or like didn't sell millions of records, right? Didn't go into a you know, music career, but, but that could have been a lot of things that were not great. I guess. You know yeah. what I mean? Watching yes. documentaries. And <laughs> you oh, know? The, Amy, the Amy Winehouse documentary destroyed me. I came, I was with my friend Ellen in, in Nashville and I walked out of that theater and I was sobbing and she looked at me like a crazy person. She's like, what is it? I mean, that was sad, but are yeah. you okay? And I realized that when, that who I was in the moment when I was an artist, because now I write for other people, you know, and I perform out still when you can do those sorts yeah. of things. Uh-huh. And I love it. And, it, but it's a different meaning to me now than it was then. But I, who I was at the time, I hadn't dealt with a lot of childhood stuff, a lot of trauma. Yeah. And I was, I walked out of that theater sobbing and I said to Ellen, now I know, now I know why the mist mishaps that happened that kept it just out of my reach happened totally because I would not and I know this I would not have survived I wouldn't have survived it yeah it, it would have taken me out and I had things to do this podcast or you yeah know, or other songs or paintings or conversations to have you know this yes. moment right now who knows you know right. I wouldn't have had this moment and yeah. and I I remember thinking God. And because it, when things are taken, what feels like they're taken from you and you're so fucking pissed and you don't understand and you've worked so hard and you put everything, your lifeblood into something and it doesn't happen, mm-hmm. especially when you're on the precipice, mm-hmm. right? That you're mad at God or whatever your, the things that you believe in, or maybe you don't believe in that kind of thing, but you know, you're mad. And, and I was, I didn't understand it, but as I walked out of that theater, I had a conversation with my higher being, Mm -hmm. my God. And I thought, I I actually said, thank you. Thank you for loving me enough to not give it to me. And that's a fucking wild moment to have, you know? Yeah. Thank you for loving me enough for not giving me that thing I wanted with every ounce of my being. I love that. Well, and you and I are exactly alike. Like what you just said, I was like, (laughs) <laughs> that thing right there. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if you ever felt this as well. Um, because I, I, for years had regret of like, well, Atlantic said they want to go do solo stuff with you and you didn't do it. And all this stuff and carrying a lot of somewhat regret around all that and being real mad at myself. Um, and then coming to conclusions like you did, but also waking up to and this felt like a grow-up moment to be like do you understand what the music industry 
really is and does. Like, I don't, I think, I think I had a romantic idea or knew what I loved about it. But the truth is, Care Bear, that's probably not what that you're going to get because that's not what it does. And that was a real wake up to me, just especially like watching all these documentaries going, what it really entails is what looks like to me, like a lot of time on the road, a lot of alone time, isolation, potential sexual abuse, drugs, alcohol, drugs, drugs alcohol, yeah. yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> no recognition or belief that you wrote your own stuff. Like as a woman, trolling now people mm-hmm. look at you know there was yeah. then but it was by letter yeah <laughs> a carrier pigeon <laughs> right right but like it made me look at it like like any career someone would go into when you first think you want to do something you don't know what it really will entail right like oh i think i want to work at this cool company because it looks cool well once you get inside you're like oh it actually entails this And it was the same thing with music. I was like, oh, I know the things I love to do. But when you get in there, it's actually going to entail this. And that was a real wake-up call for me. And it helped me go, oh, yeah, I don't want that. (laughs) There's also not a lot of uh, encouragement of growth. I remember when John Mayer came out as his, you know, his albums kept changing the kind of style. And people just shredded him. How dare you be an artist who continues to grow? Yeah. Which to me, as an artist, I thought, well, of course he's going to continue to grow. Why should he have to yeah. pigeon? It's the same thing happened to Taylor Swift, another great example. Yeah. She was she, she was ostracized right. from country music so much in, in a way that they removed her face from murals of, you know, downtown Nashville, which I just learned about that, that there's a oh, big, wow, really? that, yeah, there's a, new, um, a mural in downtown Nashville with all these different uh, country artists and they painted over her. Yeah. Oh, it's awful. That is insane to me. <laughs> well, and all just things like that, knowing she's the work, like just a lifetime lifestyle. I mean, I know somebody might go, oh, well, she's just having it so easy. And I'm like, oh, you've never done that, though. You've yeah. never been on the road. You've never. Um, she's alone. You know what I mean? Not, and she's every, alone. Everything about a person's life is picked apart. Yeah. And- that's the other side of it. I mean, walking out of that movie theater is knowing that I didn't love myself enough to be able to handle someone talking about if my butt was getting bigger or if mm-hmm. I sounded off key one night or if, you know, whatever the fuck. Who knows? Or if I broke out in a, you know, an acne or, you know, whatever it was. And yeah, it's, and we changed so much. Like, look at who you yeah. are, Carrie, now compared to who mm-hmm. you, the Carrie you were then. Those are totally different people. Oh my God. I remember my mom saying, she's like, I don't know that you would have, she's like, you were so sensitive. I don't know that you could have survived that. And at the time I was like, I did kind of didn't want to hear it, but I was like, oh no, I think she was, I think she's definitely right. Like I have, I have a lot more knowledge. I have a lot more knowledge, right? Like, but at the same time, I have a better solid understanding of why I made my choices as opposed to just being mad at myself and honoring those as opposed to being mad at myself. Like I, I didn't go with Atlantic because Jason Flom was so rude. And in my mind, thank God, my rational mind was like, my instant thought was the story was uh, we were on live Atlantic. He came to town to see the band isolated me said hey Carrie come with me I gotta go look at this band so he isolated me we got in the van he literally says we don't give two shits about the band we just want to do a record with you that that hits me because we've recorded the record twice so any band who knows what that takes then he instantly goes on to individually disparage each one of my band members who have been my close creators for five years and I'm talking ugly disparaging then knowing that i gotta walk into a dinner with all my bandmates knowing he has said this what kind of fucker does that i'll be honest when he said we want to make a record with you i got it i mean my heart my intuition went yes because i knew i was talented and wanted to go do something but then my uh, when he went on to say all those awful things the next part of me literally thought instantly thought if you can do this so easy what will you do to me if i quote unquote fail 
And thank God my rational mind or my heart or my wisdom, I'll say that, my inner wisdom won. And, you know, for a long time, I thought I regretted or thought I made a mistake or whatever. But I had um, my own coach, like Erin uh, Gallagher. She's been so amazing to go like, but what if you made the right decision? Why don't we honor that? What if instead of feeling this regret, which is fueled by what you, you know, by what you think that life would have been like, what if we just honored you at the time making a very good decision? What if that was the truth? Mm -hmm. And that's really just like changed my whole, because we do get caught up in like, oh, I could have been successful and it looks like this and sold records and now I'd be doing music for a living. Never once really kind of stopping to think like, do you understand what that life would really entail? Like maybe you wouldn't have your son right now. You'd be on the road. Yeah, and it might work for a ton of people. There are yeah. people that are super happy in all their choices, and that's freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. But but I think you bring up a great point is that regret does not serve. No. No. And all again, like reprioritizing, really understanding what is a value. I mean, our our culture is very fame focused, right? Like success, fame. And like we've been saying, we've seen a lot of like successful, wealthy, famous people who are not happy at all. Like that's the joke. Like, and and to, to that point too, is you don't, the average person doesn't get to see behind that curtain. This is Ozville. Yes. This is absolute Ozville that you may think that what you're seeing is the life, but pull that curtain back. And yes. And even those who make a living now showing their imperfect life, that's also an Ozville. You yeah. have to pull that curtain back again mm -hmm. to see yeah. the reality. Well, in my life, my, my life's really awesome. I, and I'm sure you feel the same way too. Like I'm making better music than I've ever made to me. It's, you know, deeper, it's personal, it's, uh, you know, and that's great. Yeah. You know, as an artist, you know, as you keep learning and growing and uh, collaborating and getting to do all those things that really are the fun part. And I love my, like my family of my son. All of that is really good, but it's so funny how we could take all of these beautiful, wonderful things, talking to you, like getting to do all this and put it up against fame and it gets so diminished. Like it's not good enough. And I'm like, man, sure. that is messed up. Yeah. Yeah. That's our ego. That's just, I mean, and it's easy to <laughs> say, you know, and, and, but I think we seem to be saying the same thing that we know ourselves well enough to know that it probably would not have been the best life choice. Yeah. 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 That's and the I, truth. And Did I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say, I, a, a realization I had that I just like, could, you know, like accepted was like, I always knew I'd rather be the Pixies than like Christina Aguilera. You know what I mean? Like, God 100%. bless her. Like I want, I knew I wanted to make my own music, which might not have been the music that would be the kind of music that mainstream sells millions. Sure. And so you got to honor your own decisions. Absolutely. Loves. Christina Aguilera, Aguilera is redonkulously talented. That voice yes. is insane, but I don't, it wouldn't, that life would not have worked for me. Right. Yeah. And Good to know okay. yourself. We, we can have our own lives. And, and again, I, when I say, like, <laughs> try not to regret, I, I, I'm none of this. This is all just, you know, carrying me talking. It is, everybody's got to travel their own path. And far be it from either of us to tell anybody how to live their lives, of course. But it, it seems to me that regret doesn't serve as well. And yeah. I like to think, too, because, again, woo-woo, I believe that we live parallel lifetimes. And so I am confident that one version of Susan did yeah. do all those things and if I close my eyes and, and meditate or think on it I can feel that somewhere out yeah. there yeah and that's good you know and mm -hmm. that's fine because I'm I'm in this one and I don't know what this one and, and again plenty of bad days um the far more good days thank goodness and yeah. the, I don't want to look back and say I wish I would have so I'm really active now and trying to do the things that I, I want to do that feel right because I don't want to have those moments. I love further it. Down line. I feel like you're a sister from another mister. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, tell people how they can find you out on the on the internet world. 
Um, well, I have an Instagram account. It's actually Akri Carey, A-K-R-E-C-A-R-R-I-E. Um, I have a personal Facebook page, which is Carrie M. Akri. And then there's a private um, coaching group called Carrie Akri Creative that's out there. You can join that. Um, I have a website, also CarrieAkriCreative.com. Uh, I have a podcast that's called Between You and I, and it's out on all the things, iTunes, Spotify, all that stuff. Um, and then if you want to see some music too, there's a karaoke YouTube channel and you can look up any of those bands too of on oh, yeah. iTunes or YouTube and all of that. If you want to go check it out. Yeah. And I'll put links to all that stuff on heyhumanpodcast.com. So it's easy for people to find it Yay. all at once. Yay. 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 Thank you so much for this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. I'm seriously, you just changed my day around and I hope we get to talk again soon. I think I we should do you. some collaboration thing. Oh, I'd love that. I'm in. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Bye. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye. Bye.